recording guys and then we're going to kick off into the world of global health we're going to take you from your your homes and your your cabins and your living rooms and your bedrooms all over the world we're going to visit all sorts of countries aren't we brendan in the next 50 minutes we literally are we're going to go all over the world which in fact has been my life this year remarkably from the log cabin in my back garden i've managed to do more work and meet more people in more countries in africa and asia than i normally would traveling the world all from donna base all from donna base so i hope you're taking your malaria tablets and you've had your shots because we're just about to take off <laughs> So third uh, section this morning, and again, uh, we spoke about uh, we are not filling vessels this morning. We're not loading you with facts. Um, we're lighting fires, and we know that you already have a lot of fires lit in your head and your imagination. Um, but we hope uh, that we'll have a look at global health uh, uh, to set you off for lunch and beyond. Um, so we did this before last year, and uh, we understand that you've had a grounding in the principles and theory of global health. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But really what we want to do is, is to bring you into about 12 or 14 projects one after the other um, that you might possibly be interested in and see and we'll do a little bit of compare and contrast. So I'm delighted, pleased and relieved that Nadine Ferris France is joining us and really uh, driving this. Uh, thank you very much for being here this morning. Pleasure. So nice to be here. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so you can see the slide here. I think what's interesting when I was preparing this um, over the weekend is that we used to have to teach what global health actually was. It used to be an effort to say global health is, you know, the, you know, make sure you think about health that's happening in other countries. And after this year, I think nobody needs any teaching on what global health actually is, because as COVID has shown us, health is global. And of course, it's around the common health challenges. It's around migration, climate change, and global disease these threats. Um, and I just love that little quote there. It's like, think global, always think global, but then act local. And if everybody did that, we would have um, quite a different world. So, um, so what is global health? Um, you know, I'd love to even ask you in the chat, maybe just your thoughts on, on global health. So just share them in the chat, what you think global health is. And, you know, this slide just shows you that really global health is absolutely everything. You know, it's all those things that we would, we would think of. It's tuberculosis, HIV, obesity, diabetes, malaria, nutrition, COVID added to that slide. We'll be teaching on that for years, I think. Uh, Gender-based violence, but it's also looking at these things on the left um, you know, as we know from Trump and we can see from how different countries responded to COVID this year, it's a lot about politics, it's about economics, look at the decisions even our own government in Ireland had to make about how they protect people, you know, do they put the, the health of people first or the economy first? real decisions and then of course around medicine and other uh, other things there. Brendan. Well I think we're upsetting people because I think this is huge and vast and looks very very complicated and to these people who are scattered around Dublin and various other places they might be saying how can I actually enter into that it's so huge and big and vast but we, we would put it to you that all you need to you know a bit about diabetes and that bit about diabetes is enough to go into that space because when you go into that space you will find or you know a bit about obesity um, or you've got a point of view on gender-based violence that is enough to go into that space uh, for you to contribute and to engage and to be energized by it. And I would always say to people with global health, you know, start where you're passionate. Start with, with the things that you have seen in your own life or, you know, people that have touched you in your own life. It could be something that's happened in your home as you were um, as you were growing up, or it could be somebody that you met that just really inspired you. Start there and then fit it into the framework of global health. And um, you just can't you can't lose. So we are assuming that you guys have actually um, had some, as Brendan said, theoretical basis in um, in global health and that you're all familiar with the SDGs. Can I just ask you, I want to just stop and have a look at the chat and just ask you, are you all familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? Have you gone through the Sustainable Development Goals in class last year sometime? So just looking at the chat and waiting to see. Yes, good. Gina Dehay says yes. Good. Ashley Page says yep. Larry Megan Edwards says yes. Excellent. Good. Good. Well, that's good. So, I mean, I think it's always good whenever you're thinking about health to just put those SDGs, put that wheel in front of you and just remember that we're, we're really focusing on good health and well-being, which of course is interconnected to every single one of those uh, SDGs. So, 
good. Really. Global health and action. So, uh, so how do you move from having nice thoughts and intentions to actually um, actualizing and getting things done? How do you move from um, expressive thoughts to purpose of actions? And that's really what we want to look at. So there's another slide of theory. Don't spend too much time on it, uh, but it's what we're thinking about in the forum postgraduate medical training bodies uh, in devising a curriculum for specialty trainees. Now you're undergraduates, but the next thing you're going to turn into in a year or two is specialty trainees. So this is what we're thinking for you. Um, so there's the theory, but the practice is much more interesting. And that's what this se session is about. So without any more messing around, let's get our sleeves up and dive into some projects. Uh, but before we do that, Okay, let's go back to the fog and the confusion. Uh, and again, sometimes the environment can seem very perplexing. Um, you know, where, where would I ever start? Well, look, you're in an undergraduate medical school in the top left-hand part of this slide, uh, which is usually linked in somehow to a university. But very shortly, you are going to sign up for your GP training at the Irish College of General Practitioners, or you're going to sign up at the RCSI. These are your postgraduate training bodies. They're, they're often loosely called colleges. Uh, they have a grouping and they do collaborate with each other, and global health is becoming important there. So if you're going to be a surgeon, when you go to the RCSI, you'll have no trouble finding global health in the College of Surgeons. Then there are the voluntary agencies who are absolutely great. They're often made up of uh, very enthusiastic individuals. In Ireland, we're gifted. We've got a strong voluntary sector. Um, we've got the Cancer Society. We've got the Irish Hospice Foundation we heard from earlier. Um, and there are voluntary agencies that are involved in global health. Um, I'd refer you to Niall Ferguson's TED Talk, uh, where he was asking, uh, or he was exploring the issue, why did the West get so far ahead of other countries in the 19th and 20th century? He's Scottish. And he had a beautiful, uh, he said, the six killer apps uh, of the Westerners. And one of the killer apps was this propensity to develop clubs or society or voluntary agencies. So there's undergraduate medical schools, postgraduate training bodies, voluntary agencies. There's the state agencies. There are friends. There are friends, my friends, in the HSE who are passionately interested in global health. And you can go and talk to them. And then the, the drug companies can sometimes have an interest in it. And political parties can have an interest in it. And they should have an interest in it. Uh, and our, our political parties have an interest in it. And the government spends a lot of money on global health. So don't be confused by all of this. Be glad about it, but understand the landscape and where you can actually fit in and make a difference. And then there are the international agencies, and we didn't talk about those, but it's time for the next slide. Global health projects. What do they look like? Are they any good? Can you get involved in any of them? What are the principles that increase the likelihood of a good project? Just before you all landed, Nadine and I were saying, it is amazing the number of global health projects that were started off by medical students. In the ICGP, we're very pleased with ourselves since 2017. We established a special interest group for global health uh, in 2017. We did a survey of college members, two and a half, 2,800 GPs. We got responses from 240 practices who clearly interested, who clearly indicated they were doing global health or had done some or, or were interested in doing it in the future. That's 240 practices. We've moved on. Uh, we had a college motion to say that this college will establish an ICGP global health program. Um, uh, and we've participated in the Forum for Postgraduate Medical Training Body Strategic Global Health Group. Uh, we've got our newsletter. Uh, we appointed uh, an ICGP Global Health Fellow, uh, fellow John Morris, uh, in 2020, uh, and, uh, and we've we found ourselves responding this year uh, to the COVID pandemic. So there's a lot going on in our postgraduate training body, any of you that want to be a general practitioner. Great, so let's move now from uh, from Ireland all the way to Malawi. So we want to share with you um, a number of projects, as Brendan said, by way of introducing and really bringing alive what is global health, so rather than talking to you about the theory. First one here, we call it the Gori Malawi Partnership. It's a partnership between St. John's Hospital in Mazuzu in Malawi and the PAM G GP Surgery in Gori County, Wexford. And it's focused on non-communicable diseases. So unlikely, eh? You know, when you think of global health, you don't think of a GP practice here in Ireland and how that partners with, um, a, you know, a, a hospital in in Malawi. I mean, why would they do that? So just looking at non-communicable diseases, and again, we're not showing much of the theory, but it's really interesting to, to show you that this partnership is very much located in trying to make a difference in non-communicable diseases. And this map just shows you that the prob it's this, this is about the probability of dying from an NCD between the ages of 30 and 70. And if you just look at the map, the, um, the, the red, the redder it is, the higher probability that you will die between the ages of 30 and 70. And as you can see from this map, a lot of the, um, a lot of the issues, the, the developing world or the global south, as we call it, is really very negatively affected by NCDs and yet not much of a focus yet on NCDs. 
So in short, GORI, GORI Malawi Partnership, it's been, it started around 2016, maybe even before actually as I look at that, it could even be before that. It would have been, it would have been, yeah. it would have grown out, it would have yeah. grown out of the Southeastern GP training scheme yeah. uh, in general practice specialty training, uh, where the director has had an interest in Malawi going back a decade, yeah. going back to the Billy Reardon Clinic, mm -hmm. and has had trainees from the training scheme, if you're going to be a GP trainee, go down there, mm -hmm. and you could end up being in Malawi uh, for one or two or three months as part of your training, and people Peter and, um, Joe. and Joe both did that as trainees and then they set up and practice in Gori. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the first, well, this is one of the things they've done as part of their general practice. Yeah, and it's been totally mainstreamed throughout their general mm -hmm. practice surgery, which is from the outset really. And what they did is they got together as a partnership and they decided that they were going to focus on developing flow sheets and decision aids for non-communicable diseases. They were going to develop WhatsApp and Skype groups so that they could continue the learning and sharing between Malawi and Ireland. They wanted to develop a syllabus and um, a structure of a clinical fellow in NCDs and they really wanted to seek funding for all of the different types of projects and kind of initiatives that they wanted to do. How they did that was they set up a memorandum of understanding between the hospital and the GP surgery and that memorandum of understanding was really important because it put both um, both partners on an equal footing and made sure that everybody was clear about what the vision was, they jointly decided what they were going to do and then management in both in both. Uh, both organizations agreed to that. They then formed an advisory group um, with Malawi and Irish representatives and then they went on to develop a series of e-health and electronic resources um, and, and of course over the years this partnership has grown so it started with just these two partners mm. and now it has many more partners both in Ireland and in Malawi, universities, hospitals, GP surgeries and many many others um, and so far they've also managed to develop this, um, this, this structured NCD clinical fellow role um, where somebody can spend a period of time in Ireland and then do some research and have some time in Malawi for developing services. Gosh, when it's all laid out in a slide like that, it looks like a huge thing. Mm. Uh, but in actual fact, they've just been doing it piece by piece. Yep. Uh, they've had their passion and you said that's what you yeah. need to have. Yeah. So they've fallen in love with the people, they've fallen in love with the country yep. um, and they've been just putting on, and they've had good guidance and they've dipped yeah. in. So yeah. they've, they have a, a, an amazing project underway yep. and they would be very keen to see you on it yep. out there, people. Or, or here, in fact, as we learned this year. So February 2020, this project has been going on with all of these great plans. And one of the things that Joe and Peter said very clearly was whatever else this partnership was about in February 2020, suddenly it was about COVID-19. So what could they do? So with a partnership already established like that, um, how could they actually respond and support what was needed in terms of COVID-19, particularly in, uh, in Malawi? So what they did, they changed direction. They did a needs assessment in March. They used email, they used online meetings, and they basically identified the key gaps. And some of the problems that they experienced was that the information, so in Malawi, the information that they were getting was really, the quality was varied. The situation was changing really rapidly. Documents were being produced by WHO, by UN agencies, by all sorts of people, um, so many documents with so much different advice and, and recommendations that it was really difficult to actually um, it was really difficult to actually uh, know what the evidence really was. And of course, you know, people were producing a lot of evidence, but it wasn't relevant to the situation in Malawi, a very, very poor country, high prevalence of HIV. And Peter and Joe had mm -hmm. been to Malawi on the ground yes. several times. They really know what it's like in Malawi. Yeah. yeah. So? So they did something. <clears throat> I'm just going to try and move our slide. So what they did then was they looked, they, they reviewed the international guidelines, they identified some of the areas, um, particularly asking, literally asking their colleagues in Malawi, what do you need? Not what, we, what do we think you need, but what do you actually need? And they came up with something that was very surprising to them and to everybody. They decided to develop a short, a series of short videos to disseminate via WhatsApp and social media, particularly Facebook, which is very popular in Africa. This is what the people in Malawi said we want. That's we right. don't want another textbook. We don't want another WHO report. We need short video clips that people can watch on their phones because that's what everybody has in Malawi. Yeah. So they had the thought, okay, well, we should collaborate. Who should we collaborate with? So they, they looked out, they, they, they talked to colleagues in the HSC, they talked to us in the Irish, for, uh, Irish Global Health Network in the Esther Ireland Partnership, the ICGP, and of course the, the colleagues in, uh, in Malawi. 
they had the previously they had one of the senior administrators from St. John's Hospital over here and I had a conversation with him and he was very excited about the hospital because he said we got, just got a bigger corral and I said how many beds have you got in the hospital and he said about 200 and I said what do you need a bigger corral for was for the animals I said what do you need a corral for animals for well you see people actually pay for their care by bringing in animals oh and I said what do you do with the animals well now that we've got a bigger corral we can hold them for longer and then when we've got enough then we bring them into the city and we sell them and that's how we fund the hospital. Mm. So what they worked out with the series of videos that they then went on to develop was that there was a need in Malawi, there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of gossip in the community and um, the testing facilities in Malawi were obviously not very, um, very well developed. So people had a lot of fear about whether COVID was actually spreading and how it was spreading. There was a lot of misunderstanding about how COVID was spread, how to protect yourself. And they decided to produce this series of videos that focused on how to get an institution, a health institution ready, how to maintain essential health services, how to protect health workers, clinical care um, within the context of COVID, and then also addressing myths and facts. So we wanted to actually show you one of those videos. It's just three minutes long because it really brings to life uh, what it really brings to life what uh, what they did. So these videos were produced as a real collaboration. This is what people said would be useful. Uh, this is what would work for us. Uh, uh, Peter and Joe had done this before with them, so they were in the zone. Uh, chance favours the prepared mind. Uh, and so these were the videos that they produced. So here is one of the 14 videos. Is that OK, Aileen? Very good. I need to stop share and then share that on if that's OK. So when they put these up, they had very modest expectations. They thought this could be actually quite useful for Mizuzu and the region, okay? And this, this, this video would be able to guide a health attendant who's trying to do a community clinic. Um, so we, we could make a difference in a, in, a, in, a, in a small part of Malawi and we would be very happy with that. That's what they were thinking about uh, when they put these mm. videos up. So interesting. They had absolutely no expertise in, um, they had absolutely no expertise in video making, in animation, in, they had absolutely zero expertise and that's why they needed to collaborate with people. They needed to become not just GPs and doctors anymore, but they needed to become multimedia specialists, right? Which is not a problem. Never a problem. So this is what's known as putting the general in general practice. So here you go, enjoy. Preparing the institution for COVID-19, five three of three, maintaining essential health services. There are three priority objectives: to manage flow of COVID-19 patients, to protect the world of the health care workers, and to maintain essential health services. During the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the excess in deaths from measles, malaria, HIV, and TB exceeded the number of deaths from Ebola. So, as your institution comes under increasing pressure with the rise of COVID 19, it is critical to define and prioritize the maintenance of your essential health services. Consider establishing a COVID 19 incident management team to create and implement a coordinated institutional response. Consider also how the institution maintain staff in the post as they go to smoking and the number rises. Train and upscale the system health workers to maximize the scope of practice. Consider the rise in student and physician health care workers and medical students. Limit the number of patient encounters where possible. Continuing existing drug regimes. Identify routine and elective services that can be delayed. Reassign staff. Request part-time staff to expand hours and full-time staff to work overtime. If workers in high-risk categories for complications of COVID-19 may need to be reassigned to tasks that reduce risk of exposure. Where possible, offer staff local accommodation arrangements to protect health workers' families from exposure. Health workers with new onset of cough or fever must practice self-isolation as likely COVID-19 and should not return to work until 14 days after the onset of symptoms. Consider having an institution in the for key services, childhood immunization, antenatal care and childbirth, Acute presentations in vulnerable populations, including young infants and older adults. Supplies of medication for patients with chronic diseases, including HIV and mental health. Continuity of critical inpatient therapies. Management of emergency health conditions and normal acute presentations 
that require time sensitive intervention, such as acute abdominal pain, regulatory services, and blood work services. Great. So just while we're putting the slides back up, I want to ask you if you can put in the chat, how many views do you think these videos got? They were produced in April. How many views do you think these videos actually got? No, there wasn't an active program of dissemination. They were, originally, the beginning. They were originally targeted for, Mizu, for, for, for Malawi. Malawi from Azuzu. Yeah. yeah. So what do you Pick think, guys? Figure. Pick a figure there. We're looking to Caitlin, see. Caitlin, what do you think? Amy Rose, what do you 10, think? 10,000, says Joshua Weinberg. Interesting. What Caitlin else? Caitlin O'Brien says 500,000. Five, 500,000. Do we hear any advance in 500,000? 500,000. Going once to what Caitlin O'Brien. Come on, come on. Have you had your cappuccino this morning? What do you think? Uh, Owen 25,000. Farrell says 25,000. Yeah, 25, Boo hiss. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you will not believe this, guys. Wait till you see. Look how many. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. Here we go. Look at this, guys. Over 2 million views all over Africa. It was unbelievable, unprecedented. And it was, it was because the information out there was just not accessible to health facilities and to countries in Africa who needed to understand quickly what do we do about COVID. So there you have it in Malawi. And look, my gosh, look at Nigeria. The Nigerians just couldn't get enough of this good stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a project. Okay. And you can see where it started. It started uh, uh, young colleagues, rather like yourself. Uh, it carried through and they, they got impetus from their training scheme um, and then they really put down a strong foundation. They've had some fantastic friends in the way, uh, uh, including Esther, um, and I hope our college has helped them out. Um, and that's what they've done. And it's between a practice uh, and, a, and a community really uh, in Malawi. Let's look at some really big projects that are going on in Ireland. Um, so I'd like just now, I'm not going to go on about them, Kosexka, Kineska and Equals. And they're each kind of uh, uh, started by one of the postgraduate training bodies. Uh, the RCSI have played an absolute blinder with COSEXCA. It's a college of surgeons for Eastern, Central and Southern African countries. Uh, the anaesthetists, who always work closely in hand with the surgeons, then uh, set up Kineska, um, uh, the College of Anesthesiology of, uh, of well, Eastern, Central and Southern Afri uh, African countries. Uh, and equals uh, the, the College of Physicians. This was based uh, less around education initially, but more around the provision of equipment. So Kosexka and Kineska were all about training um, and upskilling, uh, whereas equals was about getting equipment into hospitals because the African landscape is littered with uh, rusting equipment that was sent out that was not well set up was not supported and was not used. Uh, so the College of Physicians in conjunction with the engineering department in the HSE said we can do better than this and that's what they've done. Now what's nice about these projects is these have scaled uh, and COSEXA particularly uh, turns out around uh, two to three hundred uh, surgeons who've completed I think a five-year postgraduate training from general fel uh, surgical fellowship. Uh, they've been trained to a high standard, they've been examined, most of the work has happened in the host countries and most importantly they stay in their host countries. They are not seduced into doing bum butt jobs in Australia or New York. They stay in Tanzania uh, and Malawi and so on and so forth. So they're thrilling. So the obstetricians, gynecologists are up to the same kind of thing. And in the ICGP, some of us believe that there's a, a place for CAPEXA, which is Colleges and Academies for Primary Care Education in Central, Eastern and Southern African countries. To which you might say, well, why is all this going on in Africa, eh? Mm. Yeah, it is an interesting question and actually there's no reason why it only has to go on in Africa and in fact there's so many things that do go on past and, and outside of Africa but the issue is that our overseas aid program and Irish aid has um, focuses on seven priority countries which are all in Africa except for Vietnam. But you see there are things about why Africa is actually quite a good place because of the existential level of need. Of course. Um, because if you're a busy clinician or a busy student and you've got limited time to travel, if you can travel anymore, if you do on the same time zone up and down to Africa is a lot less expensive on your readjustment than if you're going to Cambodia, for example. Um, uh, and also there are African countries where uh, we've got a lot in common. Uh, we were all part of the British Empire and English is spoken in Zambia, for example, yeah. and Malawi. Okay. So anyway, there is a good close focus on Africa and a lot of traffic north south. So we've looked at Gori Malawi. We're going to go on to Standing Voice, uh, which is also in Malawi and Tanzania. We're going to look at the Near Eye Clinic, which was by third year medical students. 
Um, Hospice Jenga, uh, we might have time to zip over to Cambodia, um, and then there's Atlantic Humanitarian Resources. So we'll just touch on all of these, and we can do a little bit of compare and contrast. And Tanzania, we have a Tanzania look as well. We do. Mm -hmm. So we are the people uh, who owe the rest of the planet, uh, who live in these countries. OK, uh, with a life expectancy of more than 80 years. And it's not just 80 years, it's 80 quality years, as opposed to 45 years uh, or 50 years in Malawi with the last decade with significant disability. We are living in different centuries and different planets. We are living on different planets. Well, it's all the same planet, actually. Standing voice, OK? So this, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, is Carlo D, uh, who's a practice manager. Um, it's Mark. Uh, 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 Wheeler, um, who's a GP principal, uh, and it's their uh, daughter whose name appears on the slide, who was uh, at the time, uh, she was an adolescent at the time. A TY student, I'd say. Uh, or something like mm -hmm. that. Okay, so you can, so they, they, they look, this is how they look in November 2020 at the end of it. Okay, uh, they started in 2013, and again, they just loved the idea of Malawi. They went out to the Billy Reardon Clinic, which is next door to the Gori Malawi Partnership, and they saw what was on the ground. They fell in love with the country. Um, Molly came as well, and that was important. And of course, this might be self regarding uh, male aggrandizement, but Mark decided he wanted somewhere safe that he could bring his family. Okay, so that's all very possessive. Okay, and I apologize for all that. I think the same way myself, but it was a consideration in, in his deciding where we would go. Um, and he was very clever to bring his practice manager with him. Um, so there's Malawi. We've been there already this morning. Okay, uh, population I think of around 8 million. It is one of it's the fourth poorest country on the planet. Uh, most people in Malawi will die without ever, ever seeing a doctor at all. So we're working with health attendants uh, who work on the ground, who have various or no qualification, they have an interest and they have life experience, and we're bringing and adding to that. Um, there's Malawi. Yes, it is as difficult and, uh, and dreadful as you might think, and you're very likely to die from diarrhea if you're three years of age in Malawi. Um, and you've got the competition, and this is what Mark and Carl found out. This is the local uh, faith doctor, and this man, uh, and you know, I don't know how many of them are women, but there's a lot of men, this man can do lots of things. He can bring back lost lovers. Um, he can stop premature ejaculation. He can help you pass your exams. He could help you on final met, okay? So, the, so, so you have to acknowledge and understand this. Now, um, what they found uh, is, is they found that there are approximately 10,000 people in Malawi with albinism. And that is the gene pool in Malawi and Tanzania contains a significant amount uh, of albinism. And this is what they actually found. Um, I never knew about this really until I sat in a room with Carl and Mark. I was shocked to my middle-aged white Irish core. Um, uh, so these are people uh, in uh, Malawi who have uh, albinism. Uh, they're the hard figures. OK, global uh, prevalence of 1 in 18,000, as high as 1 in 1,400 in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and if you like, Carl and Mark's target were 10,000 people in Malawi uh, with albinism. Uh, the average life expectancy in Malawi is in the order of 50 years plus. The people with albinism were dying uh, in their middle 20s and dying horribly. They were dying from squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, on the way, they got blind. They were discriminated against. They had to go and work in low-paying manual jobs out in the field, all the better to get their skin irradiated. And they were discriminated against, and significant proportions of them down the country were murdered and eaten. Um, because of the mythical properties of the flesh of an albino. It's an, an incredible story. The worst of Netflix couldn't actually make it up. Mm -hmm. So on the top left-hand slide, you can see a necrotizing extended uh, large ulceration of the upper extremity. Um, the suffering is absolutely unspeakable. Uh, so this is what they found when they went looking in 2013. And not just the suffering, but the stigma as well. So living in a country where you know everybody is black, there's the real uh, people cannot understand how how people are like this, and there's huge stigma and huge fear. So they did some of the standard manoeuvres. Uh, they went out, they fell in love with the country, they picked their area, and then they found local uh, people to collaborate with, including the brilliant Bonfest Massa, um, who uh, was working in the equivalent of a non-governmental organisation, the Association of People with Albanese in Malawi, APAM. Uh, and well, Malawi in 2013, population 8 million, had a single dermatologist, Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So they moved up to Kelvin, and Kelvin was just delighted uh, to engage. And they've had a long, complex, not entirely smooth process, but now look where they're at. 
uh, well, Karl and Mark would say, don't reinvent the wheel. Okay, so they uh, tagged Standing Voice, which is a bigger NGO, uh, active in Tanzania uh, and Malawi, uh, and they borrowed some of their connections and their process, uh, connected with communities around the area, uh, understood straight away, well, look, we're G Mark would have been a GP with an interest in dermatology and minor surgical procedures, so, that, so that's what he wanted to go out and do, but they very quickly realized, well, you need to do education as well, and you need to help out with the advocacy that's going on as well as healthcare. Um, so uh, this is their program. Uh, back in 2013, 2014, 2016, uh, the whole issue of sun cream wasn't understood. Uh, they borrowed the, from the Australian slip, slap, slop, slip on a hat, slap on some sun cream, uh, and so on and so forth. So this educational process was put in place. Uh, and when Mark and Carl go out, their process usually is, well, they collaborate, they meet, they're meeting, and they continue those on, but they run regional clinics where people come, and they're gradually strongly connecting and putting these life-saving measures in place um, and so there they are okay uh, so they've created their own management team they've got funding they've got funding from Esther from Standing Voice they fundraise in their practice in Eden Park and their practice is proud and delighted and it adds some amazing things to their practice that they're actually going out doing this uh, so they've got some kit, uh, this is their clinic, this is where they're going. There's some of that rotting uh, hospital equipment we were talking about in the bottom right hand corner. Um, and uh, these are their clinics and you can see people are already beginning to dress and hat up uh, and they're proceeding and they're getting on with it. Um, so it's these simple things that are transformative, things that you know about as a fourth year medical student in Trinity that you could imaginatively bring in and shine a light in some very dark spaces. And Mark got to do his minor surgery. So he's doing cryotherapy, uh, he's doing earlier diagnosis, um, he's doing excisions, um, and, uh, so, and, and he's got a process up and running. And of course, the reason he has is because he's brought his practice manager with him who really knows how to uh, uh, prevent any of us from falling into black holes of ignorance. I think what's also important is that he's training, very important. He's not just going there and, and doing all of these things, but he's training local people to be able to, um, to do these surgeries and to, um, to support people on an ongoing basis, basis. So sustainability of these things is really important, not a fly in, fly out type of, of option but how are these things sustainable? How do local people get the skills that they need to be able to support on an ongoing basis? So there they all are, okay. Mm -hmm. Impact of COVID, uh, talking to uh, Mark, who was presenting to Clare Clinical Society last week, he said, well, we're delighted because we haven't been able to go and the whole thing has continued on without us. It's mm -hmm. actually getting bigger, mm -hmm. okay. So the Malawian uh, Department of Health is consulting and being advised uh, by Mark and Carl and Bonfus. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the, it is, it's much bigger. And we said this earlier on, Nadine, actually, that this morning, we wanted to think about ourselves outside of the consulting space, that, uh, you know, what a, a powerful uh, doctor is going to do is that they are going to uh, change the system uh, and address. Mark says, well, look, this is DeLazy uh, who came along one morning to one of these regional clinics and we made a diagnosis of a probable squamous cell carcinoma. And now we know what we're doing. So we did a full excision on the spot. Uh, compare and contrast that with the HSE in a public dermatology clinic. Hello, there's socks down. Mm -hmm. So TIA, this is Africa. Um, so put your head into the space. Aspects of it can be very frustrating and things do not proceed in a linear process. But as you can see with uh, Mark and Peter, and as you can see with Carl um, and uh, Mark Wheeler, uh, there are some amazing leap forwards. Um, and these are all the things that really press their buttons. So they have had real energy and payback from the project and they're incredibly generous people. They, they weren't in it for payback, uh, but they have uh, really been embellished. So that is uh, uh, Malawi, uh, albinism and standing voice. It's a good story. That is global health. How can you, how can you not get involved in this folks? Mm. So moving from Malawi to Tanzania, um, we have uh, a so our, our ladies hospital here in Crumlin partnered with Muhambili National Hospital in, uh, in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And you can see that what they were really, what they really wanted to do was to focus positive, to really positively impact childhood cancer survival and improve service delivery. That's what they wanted to do in Muhambili Hospital. And they also wanted to assist in creating a clinical and educational center of excellence for general pediatrics. Um, also in, uh, in Dar es Salaam. Uh, this was all started by also a, a doctor who was trained here in Ireland called Trish Scanlon who went out, um, went out to Tanzania and actually never came back. She's still in Tanzania. I think she went out in 2004 and she's still there. An incredible, incredible woman. 
um, more than seven years in fact so she's got the hospital the whole hospital has come on board and what they've been doing is they have been providing clinical and technical support to the Children's Cancer Program in Dar es Salaam. I'll never forget um, Trish, she said that when she went out first there was this ward and there was eight children on the ward eight children on the ward and as you can see there's a five percent in 2004 there was a five percent survival rate from um from from the the cancers that were being diagnosed there and there weren't so many that were able to be diagnosed at the time now there is a 60 percent survival uh, survival rate and you have um, a ward that now has 70 beds on it where the children can be um the children can be and also their parents and their families can stay with them because many of the children are there for long term you want to say something, Brendan? I'm dumbstruck. Okay, so also, just wanted to let you know how this works. Um, so how it works, it's incredible. So pathology department in Crumlin receives and reports on a number of Tanzanian children cancer samples every week, facilitated by DHL, who ship the samples free of charge. How did that happen? They asked. They wanted to do it. They had a really important uh, problem to solve, and they just asked for help, and they got it. CT and MRI scans are regularly sent to the radiology team for rapid review in Crumlin from Mohambili Hospital. They're always provided. The advanced pediatric life support team has been to Mohambili Hospital for two years in a row and they've trained doctors and nurses in basic life support. Also Crumlin and I would say the whole team of Crumlin not just so we had doctors, nurses, um, laboratory technicians, all sorts of people throughout the whole hospital have been out to Mohambili and they've worked alongside local specialists and trainees. They've shared knowledge, they've shared expertise and ultimately they've saved lives. And then of course uh, recently we had um, decommissioned equipment from Crumlin's hospital which was shipped to Tanzania but not just shipped and left there but the actual uh, technicians went out to Tanzania and actually trained local people on how to use that equipment so that it was actually useful rather than just ending up like that other one in the picture which is just unused and, uh, and rusted. Um, this is Trish here, she's absolutely amazing, you can see lots of things about Trish online if you're interested in this project but when COVID hit, um, she of course was still in Tanzania and um, she just said what she was seeing was on the wards were that um, they didn't have testing capacity in Tanzania when, when COVID happened, the same as many other countries. They didn't know if people were, um, whether people were, were going to get COVID or not. Uh, people were using local transport and she, in, in her mind, they weren't, although they weren't testing, she saw that people on the ward were sick and she saw that, that children were actually dying on the ward because of their, their low immune systems. So she started arranging public, alternatives to public transport, facilitating smaller numbers, providing meals for people when they came. Um, um, you can see that she started that she noticed that there was the number of patients had decreased and then the government made a decision not to test patients unless it was absolutely necessary and in a way you have to think of the context of, of and the capacity in Tanzania you know a country where the only testing capacity really were the tests for tuberculosis which is a leading killer in a country like Tanzania and they started to take the machines that were being used for TB and to use them for COVID they just didn't have the capacity so making that decision you know although it was something you can imagine here in Ireland which is not you know would not have been a good decision they did it but how they responded there was they just decided they would treat everybody as if every child and every adult as if they were COVID positive and they went on a fundraising campaign they tapped into Crumlin Hospital they asked what to do they got PPE they put protocols in place and in fact what they saw was early action made a real difference no staff have been unwell in the ward and the fears were reduced well now you've just mentioned the F word what's that fear no what I've well, there's lots of F words Okay, what's the F word? Fundraising. Ah. When somebody says fundraising to me, I get a heart sick sensation. Mm. Um, but I, I think it was Mar it was it was Peter explained to me uh, that uh, if, say, for example, you want to put a physiotherapist in a room in Newbridge to improve the service, the physiotherapist ser service to, to people in Newbridge, it will cost you about 98 or 120,000 euros per annum to do that. Mm. But if you want to put a full time trained physiotherapist in role in, uh, in Malawi, it costs 2000 per annum. So the euro that you raise in mm. Ireland is worth 50 euros if you can get to the right place. So yeah. that's sorry, it's just I've digressed. Yeah, but it's really important and sometimes we forget about fundraising. We talk about the good work and we don't talk about the importance of fundraising. So Dublin University by Society, which many of our, our learners are members of, they could easily fund one or two physiotherapists in a year. Yeah. They, but uh, sorry, I digressed. Totally. Yeah. And, and just so you know, Trish, Trish Scanlon, so what they did was um, they have Crumlin, they have Mohambili, and they also now have an NGO called, um, it's called Their Lives Matter. And it's in, um, it's in uh, you can find it online, it's TLM, you can see it as you go to this article, you'll find a link anyway. And if you want to get involved or you want to help or you have an idea or you want to donate, go ahead. 
Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the commonalities that we have seen. So I think we've mentioned the Esther Ireland program and assuming that you know what that is, the Esther Ireland program is something that we run as the Irish Global Health Network and it's basically a, a program that supports twinning between hospital and health institutions in Ireland and hospital and health institutions in the developing world in the global south. So we at this point have supported over 30 of these kind of partnerships with small grants but also with just technical expertise like, Car like Carol and Mark would come to us and say okay how do we navigate, uh, we're having this issue, how do we navigate that, what would your recommendation be and so we share a lot of, uh, of technical support in that way too. And some of the things that we've seen as commonalities, you know, a lot of the doctors who've been trained in Ireland are interested in global health. Some of the commonalities, it's spending time in the developing countries or actually what I've seen this, this year more than anything, or just working online with partners in the developing countries. So like Mar uh, Peter and Joe, they have come up with um, a system where they share, uh, they share diagnosis and they share training using WhatsApp. And there are many people that they have tapped into who have never and never will be in Malawi, but they are so passionate about this project. So anything is possible. You don't have to travel to do no. global health. No, certainly not. Uh, benefits are very clear for partner countries. They're hugely beneficial for the individuals involved. It really does increase motivation, sense of purpose, creativity. I hear so much bad press about working in the medical system here in Ireland where people get jaded and, and burnt out. Um, but going and being able being involved in something greater than yourself um, means that you've got much more of a sense of purpose and so much more to add and to bring when you're back here in Ireland. That, that, that was the Wheeler uh, um, OD exactly. first slide exactly. uh, that we saw. That they look bursting yeah. full of energy coming yeah. out of the page. It also so, you know, it's like all of us, you want to continue learning. So what? So you finish your, your medical training and then what? Is your learning finished? I don't think so. So this really helps you to, uh, to continue learning. I also think what's really important is we often talk about, you know, this issue of how do we, how we help them and we don't think about how that translates back to what happens in Ireland. And I wanted to give you an example of another partnership that we support in Mayo. So there's Mayo General Hospital in Castlebar that partners with Londiani District Hospital in Kenya. They focus on maternal mortality. What they saw very specifically was there was massive discrepancy, discrepancies between the rates of cesarean sections porn, performed at the two district hospitals. So the rate was 32% in Mayo and it was 1% in Londiani. So when they found this, they thought to themselves, okay, is there something that we can share, some information, some experience that we can, we can share with each other? In Mayo General Hospital, the evidence that they found was used to shift the focus to ambulant care in labor, introducing alternative mother to care, mother to child child care techniques and also just normalizing the birthing process. In Londiani, the results were used to launch and commission staff training for life-saving obstetric surgery, which later saw an increase in the rate of C-section to 6.6%. So basically, because of that reverse learning, things improved in Mayo and things improved in Londiani. So there's much to gain back here. It's not only about helping there, it's about what do we bring home. So if you want quick, easy wins, if you really want to make a difference, it's actually easier to make a much bigger difference when you're going to a low middle income country yep. with a bit of guidance. Brendan, can I just make sure yeah. no one's asking any questions? I just want to just pop back and make sure there's nothing here on the chat screen. See if we're missing. We're moving very fast, guys, because we just wanted to give you a huge amount, as much as we could in this short time. Is this okay no, for everybody? No, no, no. Everything we're, going we're fine? We're moving very fast because there are a very bright bunch of people <laughs> as who, well. uh, who are surviving and thriving these difficult times. Let us know in the chat, guys. Is going okay? Are we going too fast, too slow? All okay? Let us know. Are you still there? Aha. Uh -huh. mm, yep. Yes. Good. Okay. All we're okay, gonna, Susanna Marie Martin. We're going to keep trucking. Here we go. Back to you, Brendan. Oh my God, it's an empty slide, but nothing on it. Ah, okay, sorry. We're, so Zambia next. And again, it ticks these boxes. Zambia, uh, a lot of English is spoken because it was part of the British Empire, like we were. Uh, the Near Eye Clinic, Patrick and Roland. Uh, well, they went out there, I think about 10 or 12 years ago when they were in third med. And they went out uh, and this is this is what they did. Um, so Carl and, and Mark was around a special clinical interest and clinical skill set. Um, uh, you've seen the projects that relate to uh, tweaking the way a hospital service is delivered. Um, uh, you've seen uh, uh, Peter uh, and Joe Gallagher uh, based on a community um, and, a, and a region in Malawi. Patrick and Ronan did a very classic concrete thing. They went and helped in building a clinic and this is how they did it. Zambia. 
okay, 16 and a half million uh, landlocked, uh, life expectancy rising, okay, uh, so there is good stuff going on there, um, and uh, malnutrition uh, has been a problem. So they've got both ends of the spectrum. Uh, there are more, there are middle income, more affluent people who are getting uh, overweight, uh, but there's still actually quite a lot of malnutrition, especially when you go out the country. Uh, maternal mortality rates 398 per 100,000 as opposed to less than two uh, in Ireland. Again, what did we say about a different universe? Uh, so they, in their peregrinations as medical students, uh, settled in Chilanga. Uh, in a compound there and so they're dealing with the practice population of uh, and they were not surprised uh, but upset to see all of these things unemployment alcoholism H H HIV and commercial sex work no medical facility uh, but there was a bunch of nuns there okay and so begins mm. their story there's a bunch of nuns everywhere in Africa just to say missionaries are everywhere all over Africa. This is the neighbourhood, not very attractive really, okay. Um, this is a better uh, piece of housing uh, uh, in, in Chilanga uh, because it's made out of bricks. But when you wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing you look at is you look at that roof. Uh, that's what you wake up to every morning. What did you look up at this morning when you looked out your window in Dublin 6, 8 or 12? Um, so they started to put it together um, and, uh, and over the decade uh, they have a building, they've got a better building, they've started to support uh, uh, local staff in providing better care um, and they have a variety of different fairly standard tasks. This is a key one uh, and one cause of, of preventable mortality was the transport of people with acute medical conditions into a bigger hospital centre. So they set up the facility to hydrate people before they travel. It's just life-saving, that's all. More people get uh, to University Teaching Hospital alive because they've been hydrated. Uh, this is the latest development, 2016, and again, it's got a lot of the hallmarks. They built the bigger building. Look at the Irish flag and the Zambian flag, and apologies to all you Canadians out there. Uh, here they've collaborated with some of the local business people in the community, um, as well as the people who work in the clinic, and there they all. There's Patrick at the end of the line looking really as pleased as punch with itself. Um, they've also borrowed pieces from other programs, Immunisation for Life, to improve primary immunisations. Uh, and like I say, there's a big focus on malnutrition, on earlier identification, on treating, and on growing better food and uh, diet. Uh, so, you know, if you're practising in Shannon, County Clare, or in Sligo, you know actually quite a lot about growing food, really. Um, so there it is, uh, 20,000 uh, consults a year, under five, clinic antenatal service, nutrition, HIV, it's all there. So they have done a classic health centre. and. Uh, they're doing well. They are greatly and warmly regarded and they have also been called in to the Zambian Department of Health to advise them on what is this family practice thing that you're all talking about? We need more of that in Zambia. So there it is. So you can contact them and they're delighted to hear from you and they're their email addresses and even Ronan's mobile phone. Uh, and, uh, just for a minute in Uganda, um, so you know we've spoke uh, and at one end of the spectrum there's Patrick and Ronan going out as third meds. This is Frank and Patricia who had done a fantastic life of general practice in Quinn County Clare. Uh, in their professional life as GPs they were pioneers in terms of setting up palliative care in Clare and the local hospice movement and when they had retired from 35 years of very high volume consulting they didn't sit down on a couch, they said what will we do next? So they went to Uganda and they set up a hospice Jenga and it was predicated on the things we've discussed. Partnership with the locals, understanding the need, the provision of a dry um, uh, oral morph solution uh, for a population of 4.5 million people and they just did that over 10 years. They just just went out and did it, okay? And so there it is. And that is Claire McMahon in 2010, who went out to visit with them, and I think she might still be out there. Mm -hmm. You can disappear in Africa. You can, or Africa. Asian. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've said that before, yeah. Um, Atlantic Humanitarian Resources, uh, this is a different type of project, and again, just the idea, there's a, an amazing choice for you to pick. AHR, who are they? They're a non-governmental voluntary, they're a small voluntary. Uh, they were headed up by American Muslim clinicians, uh, but they have really taken on board everybody who'd like to work with them. Their focus is on humanitarian relief uh, to northern Jordan uh, and they're particularly focused uh, at the refugee camps where there are now seven million Syrians uh, have been displaced and it's almost a custodial system. If you get into one of these camps you know that your safety level goes way up but you've got a one-way ticket and you might not get out for years. That is the reality of it. AHR go out and provide service in these clinics. 7 million people, they don't materially change the system. Uh, what they do, they do useful medical stuff. Uh, it's a weak project in terms of sustainability, but they're building on that. Uh, they normally go out two to three times a year and you might like to sign up and contact. They're very happy to bring medical students out uh, subject to a, a very simple standard evaluation. 
So this is what they're dealing with. They're dealing with, like, with Syrian people who are very like people in Ireland in that they had a, a stable middle class up to about eight or ten years ago uh, when the system became profoundly unstable. And they have been ripped out of their homes and villages and schools. Um, so you can be, go out as part of a medical team, a humanitarian team or a volunteer. They typically send out about 50 to 60 people three to four times a week and they're very well integrated with the stuff on the ground. These are the people they're looking after. They're people like you were 10 years ago. Um, this is Karina who goes out from our practice and she all, tends to bring out some Irish people with her. There's Ronan Fawcett um, uh, with her and uh, a colleague from Canada. Uh, there's uh, John O'Shea who was a first year SHO at the time uh, uh, with Karina with, with a typical team going out for a week. And you arrive, you're linked into the University of Urbid, so you'll interact with the medical students from the University of Urbid who act as your translator, which is a critical enabler. And it's a fantastic interaction. And they're also connected with the local public hospital and private hospital and this is a surgical team but they do medicine and women's health as part of what they're doing. Um, this is Karina uh, dressing uh, a, a wound from an amputee uh, and again like Mark and Carl discovering the awfulness of albinism uh, in northern Jordan uh, 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 what we have is almost certainly there are about 20 to 30,000 men who have been deliberately mutilated by a shoot, shoot to maim policy carried out by Balashar al-Assad uh, and Putin on the local population. And they limp literally uh, over the border and they're incarcerated and they have complex surgical needs and the team does a little bit with that. Um, this is other global health, global health at the other end of the spectrum. We're in Saudi Arabia today, and this is Kathleen, Tony and myself uh, helping them set up a GP training scheme. There's huge money in the room, uh, but the society is, is 14th century. You will notice that the front desks all have middle-aged males yeah. sitting in the front. Yes, I had all, noticed that. You had noticed mm -hmm. that. All the women were sitting at the back. Mm -hmm. This was the beginning of our session. By the end of the weekend, we actually had them all at their same tables and interacting mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. And the curious thing, all these doctors had trained in places like Australia and New Zealand and Dublin, but when they went back to the kingdom, they segregated again. Yeah, culture but, is strong. Well, they're becoming friends in general practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is Edith Alargi, who headed up the ICGP substance misuse program for many years. Uh, she's approaching her third age, um, and she was approached by Pakistani colleagues uh, to look uh, at uh, assisting them set up their own substance misuse program, uh, where they're dealing with uh, street kids as young as six, seven, or eight, uh, who are already opiate dependent. Mm, and you um, have to remember, in the context of somewhere like uh, Pakistan, drug use is illegal. So it's absolutely illegal. So actually reaching people with methadone clinics or any of these kind of uh, therapies is really, really difficult when it's absolutely illegal. Not to Edith Delargy. Sorry? Not to Edith Delargy, who is out there, but this is yeah. the, these are big the context of global health is, yes. you know, you, you want to, to, to provide something and in a, in a country like that, you have to somehow work within the system and legal and law makes a big difference in what you're actually able to do and how you do it. It is difficult, but mm -hmm. it is worthwhile mm -hmm. and it can be done. So blue sky thinking folks, we're winding down. OK, um, uh, and again, we said at the beginning of our sessions this morning, what kind of a doctor do you want to be? Be a great, be a great doctor. Um, uh, we overestimate what we can do in a year, says Bill Gates, but we completely underestimate what we can achieve in five. Um, I hope uh, Nadine and I have communicated some of the energy that we gain from this. Mm. We hope it's infectious mm. and we hope we've given you a series of points that you can actually enter in. Um, uh, uh, and possibly become more actively involved yourself. If you're looking for a cheery read, um, I'd recommend Hans Rosling's pre-COVID uh, factfulness book. Um, this is a really important slide. Yeah, so if you are interested in global health, um, please, please, please sign up to the Irish Global Health Network because that way you will stay in touch with all sorts of opportunities and things that are happening in Ireland. We run a, a number of events, of webinars, of seminars, of campaigns, um, and we also have a really strong student outreach team. So we definitely have students from uh, Centre for Global Health and have some med students from Trinity and other colleges. I think we have seven universities who are student outreach, part of the student outreach outreach team and what that team does is decides that if it wants to focus on for instance um, water sanitation could be a really interesting one uh, we have a small subsidy that goes towards whatever you would like to create in the college to raise awareness of global health issues so please uh, join the Irish Global Health Network and stay really really connected so you've got money who's got money uh -huh.
the Esther Island program and some of the projects that you have seen here and the ones I mentioned you can see you can go and find out much more about them on www.esther.ie and um, that really is an amazing opportunity for you to be inspired and also to see where you might want to help you know Brendan and I are not here today to say these are you know things that you can be involved in um, it, we're not speaking on behalf of anybody who's running these uh, partnerships are involved but we do know that if you have commitment skills and passion that there will be a way for you to be involved and um, there's something for everybody so just get in touch with them um, this is just more of um, of Esther as well um, and then there are just are so many ways to be involved and um, from sitting here in Ireland to traveling to uh, to thinking to social media to campaigning to communications there are just so many ways to be involved um, wanted to share with you um, a project. So World AIDS Day is the 1st of December every year and we run a, a big event for on behalf of the Irish government um, on the 1st of December and last week because of COVID we actually had uh, we put together um, a choir, a youth choir in Zimbabwe who are young people living with HIV together with an Irish youth choir, 20 Irish young people, 20 uh, Zimbabwean young people and we put them in a collaboration they worked together for four weeks they got to know each other on a Saturday morning they got to talk about their culture share their experiences talk about HIV talk about their childhood talk about what life was like for them during COVID and then they worked together to produce a, mu a song a musical collaboration called Choose to Dance um, an original song by a very good friend of both Brendan and I called Emer Crenn and this was the result so this is a very much a global health project focused around the issue of HIV AIDS to raise awareness and to uh, to stimulate connection. So we thought we would leave you with this and then we can see if there's any time for any questions. So enjoy. Thank you. 
few tears in places for this one. So global health, that is absolutely uh, a great example of global health, what is possible from Zimbabwe to Ireland in the, in the time of, of COVID where we couldn't get together and yet people can still create and connect like that. So, so they have I, yeah. no time for questions, right, Brendan? Well, it's, well, it's, late, it's lunch, yeah. uh, but you know, I mean, if you pitch in anything, if you can, if there's anything to cross your mind, we're in the last minute or two, and we're very conscious of this is hard work, actually. Yeah. Um, or even Brendan, if we could just ask you, just just put in the chat, what are you taking away from today? Did anything inspire you? Just one word or two words of what you're taking away about global health or about what you've seen or learned for yourself today. If we're doing this again for your colleagues coming up next year, is there anything we do differently, more of, less of? Um, it would be helpful to give us a bit of guidance on it. You could just post in the chat, what are you taking away for yourself today? Anybody, Alana, Anne Maria, Gina, Owen, Caitlin, what are you guys taking away? Yourselves? It's been a big morning. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Emma, absolutely. It's, an, it's interesting, isn't it? All the global health skills, I look at my own career, all the skills I have, and I think probably communication are probably the best skills that I have to offer. Totally right. <clears throat> Small initiatives can make a big difference. Malika, absolutely right. Roshan King, even though we're still students, there's, there is an awful lot. Yeah, you're students, you're <clears throat> incredibly powerful in terms of what you can do if you decide Didn't to. realize how far the money would go in these countries compared to Ireland, totally. A fiver is worth having. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Great. So we'll, we'll begin to wind down. Um, just Aileen, thank you so much for being with us this morning, and particularly the last presentation was, was more complex. Um, it couldn't have happened without, and hugely appreciate. Um, and Aileen, thanks a million for such a pleasure delivering this okay and listen enjoy the rest of your day folks and uh, Christmas is around the corner and let's just tear into uh, 2021 and maybe a bit of global health mm -hmm. happy studying guys take care <coughs>